Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another virtual shadowing session with Dental Shadowers. Today, we are so excited to have Dr. Connie Wang with us. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat box and we'll reach them at the end. And with all that being said, the floor is all yours, Dr. Connie. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for everyone that came and for everyone that's watching right now. Let me just start by sharing my screen. I always feel so naked when I do this. So if you guys see anything weird, it's not a recommend, not a reflection of me. Okay. <laughs> Let's do view slideshow. Alrighty. Can you guys see the, everything? Okay. I actually can't see anything, so I just need someone yes, to say yes. I, I can see it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you very much. All righty, guys. So uh, I'm here to share with you guys not just how to survive, but I want you guys to really thrive in dental school. Um, I believe someone's microphone is on. I don't know if... Okay, perfect. Um, but I think this is just really important because it's a really exciting time for you guys when you're in dental school clinic. You know, it's the first time that you guys are seeing patients and of that sort. So it's natural to feel really intimidated. I know I was really intimidated. Um, and there's this common misbelief when you're in your first and second year of dental school where you think that like, all I gotta do is like make it to third and fourth year. That's, that's the sweet spot, that's the homeland. That's what we wanna get to. From there, it'll be easier because you think less exam, less projects, all that. So it was a very rude awakening for me when I was a third year. I thought I had finally made it to third year, right? And then I realized, oh no, we had just basically started a whole new world, a whole new ball game, and it was very intimidating and very stressful and challenging. Um, the best way that I describe dental school is it kind of feels like every single year is a new video game with a new like final boss that you have to learn how to overcome. And the second that you overcome that one, a new boss comes along. So clinic is kind of the same way where all of a sudden, you know, the familiarity of the tests are gone, the products are gone. It's that, that's the great part. You know, there's a lot less of going into clinic and stuff on like weekends because now you just see your patients. Um, but it really is a whole new ball game. And so that's not to deter anyone, but it's just to let you guys know that it's a whole new fresh start and there are a new set of rules. And that's why I wanted to give you guys this little game plan. And this will hopefully help you guys, like I said, not just survive, but really thrive. So First things first, who am I? So my name is Connie Wang. I went to pharmacy school before this. I know some of you guys have followed me from back when I was in pharmacy school on rotations and when I was still interviewing for dental schools, which is so awesome. It really blows my mind that you guys have been with me this long um, and I just really appreciate it. So yeah, so I went to pharmacy school in the University of Rhode Island and then I went to Tufts Dental School and I just graduated. And now I am a general dentist in Massachusetts and my new baby is, well, first actually my puppy, Ellie here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now my newest baby is my podcast, Just a Quick Pinch. It is a lifestyle and self-help podcast for young women in healthcare. Although we do have a, a good amount of male pinchers too. So if you're a male, if, if you are a male, give it a listen to. We have lots of good advice for you guys too. But that's just some background on who is presenting to you guys today. So let's get into it. So what is the most stressful part of clinic? Um, a lot of people, I myself even thought it would be treating the patients. You know, we do a lot of fillings on our plastic mannequins, but when it comes down to it, it seems really scary to be doing it on a live person, right? And that is scary, but what I found was the most stressful thing actually wasn't really what was happening in the chair when I was with the patient. That was actually the fun part. That's like kind of why we want to go to dental school, right? Is to treat the patients. That gives you so much satisfaction and joy. That's something to look forward to in clinic. But the most stressful part of clinic was honestly the things you cannot control. Okay, guys, so there's things that first and second year, we just didn't have to worry about. Um, first and second year, it was kind of like, it was very, uh, like, you know, those like math, uh, equations where it's like x equal what is it okay now I like totally forgot the example of like the math equation I should have looked this up beforehand but there's like a linear equation right and so it's like if you put in this many hours of studying you will most likely get this grade everything kind of correlated and everything was your responsibility and it was it was tough because you had a lot of responsibility to study in that sense but it was all within your control. And that's the beautiful part of the first two years of dental school. You control your grade on the projects, you control how hard you work and the outcome will usually correlate. In the real world, this is the horrible part of clinic, okay? And this is why um, we are supposed to get this experience third and fourth year because otherwise it would be a complete utter shock to your system. 
um, once you get into the real world, because this is what real world dentistry is, okay, you guys, it's not the mannequins, it's not the test, it's not biochem, it's your patient just can't stop bleeding, or they can't get numb, I had that this week, no matter how much anesthetic you give them, they have a hot tooth or something, it's impressions not turning out right, a lot of dentistry is actually, you know, there's ways to mitigate risk, but a lot of it is luck too, um, some days things just aren't working out right, patients cancel for their family emergencies, we get that a lot in dental school, patient cancellations, or the lab sends back something incorrect, or it just doesn't doesn't fit. These are all things that all of a sudden is a whole new world third and fourth year. And so that is the hardest part is wrapping your brain around the fact that now you have things that are ultimately your responsibility, right? You have more responsibilities than ever, and you have less control than ever. And that dichotomy is really what makes clinic hard. Uh, when I say more responsibilities, I mean, you know, in dental school, we still have tests and projects third and fourth year, they just get kind of easier because you just know more. But now we're balancing that with, do I have to remind my patient about their appointment? Do I have to call the insurance and get a pre-off? Do I have to go into lab on the weekend to make an extra thing of dentures? Um, the horrible part of dental school clinic is that you are a one woman show in the sense that like you are the front desk because you make the appointments, you are the assistant because you set up the room, you're the hygienist doing the cleanings, you're the dentist doing the dentist thing, and you're the lab doing the lab. It's a lot of work. Um, and so that, like I said, the more responsibilities, but less control is very frustrating for people like us, especially that go into these fields where, you know, either we're perfectionists or we're very hardworking and we expect a certain amount, um, of, you know, of effort and a certain amount of things from ourselves. We, we just have a lot of pressure on ourselves. So my first tip for you with all this responsibility and less control, my first tip to help you guys is find your people. So what, I, what do I mean by your people? Upperclassmen, they're really helpful because they will tell you what to worry about, which is helpful, but more importantly, I want you guys to get this. The most important thing that you can learn in dental school is what not to worry about because this saves your energy. I can't tell you guys how many countless nights I spent worrying over like stupid little things, honestly, just stupid, that if I had just asked an upperclassman friend, they would say, don't worry, that happens all the time. Um, and you need all of those nights of sleeping that you can get because it's a lot, it's very stressful. So save your energy, ask your upperclassmen friends, is this something I should be worried about? If it's not, don't spend a moment on it because you have a lot of other things you should be worrying about. And the best part about underclassmen is they have all the hacks on how to be efficient. I'm a big hacks girly. That's why I have a podcast. I love interviewing people and, you know, gaining all of their little hacks and implementing them. Hacks are key, which brings me to my first hack, which is know the stackable requirements. What do I mean by that? So let me backpedal a little bit. For those of you guys that aren't as familiar, dental school, in order to graduate and get out of dental school, you have to do the following things. You have to complete all of your graduation requirements and you have to do it before your graduation date. That's really it, right? Um, and that's actually the stressful part is that's literally how they do it. They're like, here's a laundry list of a thousand different requirements, figure it out before May of 2020, whatever. And so that's the stressful part because first and second year, instead it's like, okay, everyone's projects are due next week. Once everybody's on the same page on that project, we're gonna move on to that one. In clinic, there's none of that. You know, you're gonna be thrown into clinic and then your friends next door, they're gonna start their denture case because they have a patient that needs dentures. You're gonna be like, huh, I don't have any dentures, but maybe I'll have a patient that needs cleanings. You'll start. And the thing is, that's what makes clinic a little tough is that all of a sudden you're ripped away from the structure that everyone is on the same page and it feels kind of like you're on your own. You're never truly on your own, which is why I stress it's important to find your people, find your upperclassmen, but that's kind of how requirements work, okay? It's not like, okay, this week, everyone's getting their filling requirements done. This week, everyone's getting their crown requirements done. And that's why you hear so many dental students stressing about their requirements. And that's why you hear about people that don't graduate on time is because these things happen, you know? It's very archaic. And, you know, I wish that it wasn't run this way, but that's just how dental school is. And so the first key to help you guys graduate on time, to help you guys graduate, period, is, like I said, know the stackable requirements. So when I say requirements, all of us have to graduate with X amount of fillings done, X amount of crowns done, doesn't matter who, where, when, what, just get them done before you graduate. So what I mean by stackable requirements here is every dental student that will listen to this will agree with me. When I tell you there are some things that are just silly and quick to get done. For example, one of our graduation requirements, okay, I, I, silly is a harsh word, but what I mean by that is it's not like you're doing a procedure. It's like, for example, one of our requirements was to like survey a patient on how they thought their experience was. It was called a post-treatment exam or something. 
that's a stackable requirement because when I had the patient in my chair to do a filling, I could also at the very end sneak in that requirement. Do you see what I mean by stackable, right? So the name of the game to succeeding in clinic is how can I get the most requirements done in an appointment efficiently? And that way I don't have to bring in the patient as many times, because the more times you have to bring in a patient, the more variability you're adding in. Maybe, you know, you schedule a patient for five appointments. What if there's a snow day on one? What if the patient has a family emergency on the other? What if you get sick on the next one? The more appointments you have, the more variability you're setting up yourself up for. So ultimately this tip can be boiled down to be efficient and get the most that you can done while the patient is in your chair. Because when they're in your chair, that is promised, okay? You can get whatever you want done. So the best thing to do is to look through your list of requirements, figure out which ones are stackable, which ones are just surveys you just have to ask them, which ones are simple little like notes that you just put in and you have someone swipe, which ones are things that are easy to combine, nice and quick, basically, that you can stack them all together in the appointment. So for example, how my school worked was we had three hours to get whatever we want done, basically. Um, you had to book them for one specific thing. So let's say I book my patient for a cleaning um, for that appointment. The cleaning is not going to take three hours, but, and it would be great. There were many days where I was like, I just did the cleaning and then I went home and then relaxed and hung out with my friends or whatever, but responsible third year me, and this is what helped me graduate early or finish my requirements early was after that cleaning. Now you still have two hours to get that survey done, get that impression done, get those easy stackable requirements done while they're still in the chair. That way you can go home, you know, feeling good, knowing that you've got a bunch more requirements done and you're that much closer to graduating. So let's go back to find your people. My last trick is upperclassmen are key because not only do they tell you what not to worry about and how to be efficient, they know the faculty that you will work well with. So everyone will work well with a different type of faculty. And that's my actually extension of find your people. Your people are your faculty too. There's someone for everyone, like I said. Everyone will have a different favorite. And it's kind of crazy. It's, it's like the real world. You know, you're not gonna become best friends with everyone, but you're gonna have someone that you resonate with and your best friend, like maybe they'll resonate with someone else. So. I do say, you know, like ask around, see who you think is like, has great reviews, is great to work with. Ultimately, faculty all wanna help you. They did this job because they wanna help you learn um, and they all have their own teaching styles too. So what I mean by this basically is find which one meshes well with you. Faculty are also important because you need these people on your side. They are so helpful. They are a wealth of knowledge. Not only that, they understand big picture dentistry in more ways than you ever could. Because right now, let's say you're looking at a filling, you're thinking about it in steps like A, B, C. Faculty, they've been working for so long. They know how, like everything about the procedure inside and out. They can tell you like, okay, we'll make a, step A faster by doing this. They can help you with so many things because they are so experienced, like I said. And they are the difference between getting something done in one visit versus two. So remember earlier just now when I said like it's better to get a bunch of requirements done in one appointment than just one requirement, right? It all comes down to being efficient, which is something everyone will tell you. Now with faculty, if they trust you, if you work well one-on-one -on -one with them, you build a good rapport, they're going to let you, let's say you only have 30 minutes left. They don't, and, and they know you, they know that you're experienced or maybe they know that you're very conscientious and that you tend to read up on the procedures before you go in. They might be more willing to let you try something and finish something. Whereas if you're, you know, not, if you don't come prepared or you, don't really present yourself in a great way in front of these faculty, they might look at the clock and be like 30 minutes, I know this person can't get it done and they won't help you get that done. So everyone's a little bit different in how much time they're willing to let you work with. You know, every attending is different, every faculty is different. So that's what I mean when I say like, learn who you mesh best with and how you work best and together you guys will be a really good team to get that work done for your patient. Um, and then also last but not least, don't get too many cooks in the kitchen. So what I mean by that is if you show one patient to five dentists, you will have five different treatment plans. Everyone treatment plans differently and none of them are wrong. That's the beauty and the tricky part of dentistry. And so the thing is the more cooks you have in the kitchen, by that I mean the more doctors you have looking at your patient's mouth, the more opinions you're gonna have and the more muddied it's gonna be. And so the best course of action to make things more seamless, more efficient, faster, more predictable is to be working with the same person as much as you can throughout the whole thing. Otherwise, the most frustrating thing is when you bring a patient to your chair and one day they have a doctor that looks at it, they're like, okay, this is ready for next time, do this. 
Then you bring in the patient next time. And then a new doctor looks at it and they're like, why are they here? You still need to do this, this, and this. And you're like, the other doctor didn't mention that. And that's because the other doctor is working. They have a different treatment plan in mind. This doctor has a different one as well. So do you see why that's frustrating for your patient? Because you understand as a dental student that there are a lot of variables and a lot of different ways to do something. That patient does not have that insight. So that patient's going to go home and think like, wow, I didn't get anything done. They don't know what they're doing. And now we're starting all over. And so we don't want that. We want the patient to feel like they can trust us and like we know what we're doing. Um, or we want them to at least trust that we'll be transparent when we need that help and when we don't feel like we know what we're doing. So that's the biggest thing. Don't have too many cooks in the kitchen, streamline it and try to work with the same people. For example, like I knew when my favorites and the people I worked best with were working. So I would strategically book my patients for those days. And my patients love that because they're like, yes, I love this doctor. I want to work with them more. So it's really win-win for both you, the patient and the faculty. And that's how you learn best is having that continuity of relationships. I owe my dental degree to like a handful of my favorite faculty that like really saved me and taught me so much. And um, it's, it's been, it's been incredible to see how much of a relationship you can build with your faculty. And that's why they're there is to help you. So this brings me to hack number two, something I didn't think about was I was like, okay, you know, I want to get my requirements done. And this is a little side tangent. Everyone can do clinic differently. And that's what makes it hard. Some people, so for example, I was the kind of person where I wanted to get my requirements done ASAP Rocky as soon as I could. That way I wouldn't be worrying about graduating on time. That way I could spend my free time doing whatever I wanted, learning whatever extra stuff I wanted, working on my podcast. You know, I, my, the name of my game was how to finish things early. That might not be someone else's prerogative and that is totally okay. You know, some people, maybe they wanna take their time or maybe they wanna take vacation time. That's the thing, third year, I didn't take like a single vacation. I didn't, I was there like nine to seven every single day if I could. I was really trying to grind and finish everything third year. But let's say, you know, you had a tough time first and second year and you wanna blow off some steam. You wanna take those vacations, take some week off. At my school, you were able to make your own schedule. So if that is what you want to do, then by all means, go ahead and do that. So, so my biggest my guide biggest for guide everyone for listening to this is just do what feels right for you and what your priorities are and don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Sure. That being said, so my path to this and a lot of what today I'm going to tell you is kind of how to do things efficiently, like I've been saying, you might catch on to that. And that's because that was my prerogative. So hack number two to how to get things done efficiently so that you have more time to learn or do whatever you want is you need to block off time to plan and prep, not just see patients every day. So you know how earlier I said third and fourth year, I was really grinding, right? I was like in school nine to seven, like all of the appointments times possible. The thing was, I wasn't seeing a patient nine to seven. I was usually spending like, let's say, here's an example, maybe like nine to 12, I had blocked off to call my patients prepare things, plan things, maybe like call the lab or like figure out what I'm doing, do the lab work myself. And then maybe I was seeing patients the rest of the day. So the thing is you will absolutely burn out if all you do is see patients nine to seven, because the problem is it's kind of like the phrase you want to work on your business, not in it. Because when you're working in your business, you're constantly trying to like catch up on everything. You can't really see the big picture. It's exhausting. When you're, oh, maybe I totally reverse this phrase. I think when you're working on the business, you can see things from an oversight kind of view and you can plan ahead and be strategic, not do things multiple times, not backtrack. And that's what I mean when you have to be efficient, you have to have the foresight to look ahead and know like, okay, what appointment is coming after this? How can I strategically maybe schedule them? So that way they only have to come one time for something and we'll get a consult done the same day. So that was how I finished my requirements quickly and efficiently was by blocking off time to really strategically plan and, you know, giving myself that time. Again, that's because my school allowed us to make our own schedule. So I was able to take a morning off, take an afternoon off, whatever take an evening off to strategize. Let's say your school makes your schedule for you. One thing though that you can keep in mind is you can do this planning at any time. You can do it after the end of the day. You can do it on the weekends. Just make sure at some point that you're being strategic and planning because like I said, you wanna be working with an overhead view and understanding of what you need to do and not just constantly like in survival mode, just trying to get through the day. Okay, <clears throat> so tip number two, there's something called a treatment plan acceptance rate. Now this is like kind of a grown up dentist word that I didn't really hear too much about until I was like really later on in dental school. Um, but it really actually applies in dental school clinics. And I don't know why more people don't talk about it. Um, a lot of people say that in order to finish your requirements, maybe like early or finish them on time or whatever, that you have to be lucky. 
And I agree, there's a certain amount of luck to everything, but at the same time, I also really believe that we create our own luck. So part of creating our own luck is setting ourselves up for that success. And having a good treatment plan acceptance rate is part of setting yourself up for that luck. So what I mean by that is, you could be dealt your hand of tough situations, patients that always cancel, things that fall through. But the thing is, every once in a while, you are going to have an opportunity with like maybe a really great patient and you have to take that opportunity by doing the following things. You need to make sure that this patient understands why they need to get something done. You need to get your patient to care about getting it done in a timely manner. And you need them to trust that you are the one to get it done. And it all really starts from day one. So. What I mean by this is a lot of this, what you're seeing is actually patient communication. You haven't even touched their tooth yet. You haven't done a filling yet. All of this starts just from talking to your patient, which all of us can do, anyone can do it. And so that's why I mean like, yeah, maybe it is luck, but it's kind of not in that you can take the initiative to do the things that I did, which are drawing them diagrams so they understand something, um, making sure you're really, really crystal clear about costs and expectations on things, um, you know, having a teamwork mindset with your patient and making sure that they have their own accountability for getting their stuff done. You can't force someone to care about their teeth. So if they're not going to be accountable for it, then you're really just wasting your time because you can't really change that if they don't want to care. Um, the biggest thing that people would always say, faculty would say in dental school was it's not just the cleaning. And you know, I used to hear that and like be like, yeah, yeah, it's not just a cleaning. It felt like just a cleaning. But the thing is, it's really not because what I realized was cleanings were my time to really have that patient build that trust, to build that trust with that patient that, you know, first of all, your patient, all they really want is their, is their cleaning. Okay, no one really wants to get cavities or no one wants to get fillings and crowns done. So the only thing that they're really looking forward to is the cleaning because it feels nice and it's kind of like a facial for your teeth, you know, like they want the cleaning. So from day one with that first cleaning, you need to go above and beyond and exceed their expectations because that's the only way you're going to get them to come back. If you give them a horrible experience, if you clearly don't care about them, you don't, you know, make them feel like you're the kind of dentist that they want to work with, they're just not going to come back. And it's so simple. And then you're not going to be able to get any of the things that you spent so much time looking for and treatment planning with them done. So now maybe I'm like grown up and washed up or something, but I agree with those faculty. It's never just the cleaning. That is a powerful time for you to make a bond with the patient, connect with the patient and explain to them again, why they need things done. So my cleanings, I saw more as almost like conversion time with the, pa with the patient to kind of like help them understand more why they needed things done. Number three, so I keep talking about the patient, good patients. What does that mean by good? Um, so not everyone is a good fit for the school and that is okay. I'm not saying they're bad patients if they're not a good fit, but I am saying that you should be focusing on building your roster with the ones that will work with you. So what I what do I mean by that? They need the right work done. I wish that, you know, we could just graduate just doing like cleanings and stuff like that, but then we would never learn, right? We need people that need the right amount of work done in that they need more than just the cleaning. We need patients that need fillings, cav or fillings, crowns, dentures, whatever, root canals. Um, but we also need patients that are not going to be so complex where they'll either be referred out to like the other clinics, they'll be referred out to another dentist. Like we, it really has to hit the sweet spot, which is not something I understood until I started clinic. Now I understand, you know, like the ones that will be the best fit for the school are the ones that need a couple things done that I can do within my own scope. Um, ones that are willing to work with you and show up on time. Again, like they have to be accountable for getting their their care done. Otherwise, they will not show up and it is really a waste of your time because they will never come back. Um, and then also you need patients that will be patient with you and that can handle the days and times where it's going to feel like nothing got done because there will be days and times where it feels like you're backtracking, redoing things. And that's just what dentistry is. But we need patients to be understanding and especially understanding that it is a school. And so things will take longer than outside practice um, and all of that. Okay, so this brings me to hack number three, which is color code by requirements. So this is probably the most tangible thing that I want you guys to walk away with when you're in clinic. This is how I mentally sorted through all the, the requirements that I had to get done, all the ones that I already did, and all the ones that I should be hunting for. Because it's almost like a little game in the sense that like, yes, you are treating your patients, you're providing care, but at the end of the day, you have to be efficient you have to be thinking about okay like what are the things that i'm progressing in and what are the things that i need more experience in if you're not aware of that then you won't be able to ask for help and it'll be harder and harder for you come graduation time to get everything done on time 
So this is an example of my graduation requirements kind of sheet that I made. I made a list of all the things that I had to get done before I graduated. This is just a little snapshot. So I color coded them according to the stage they were at. I color coded it blank if I had no patient that on my roster that needed any of that, meaning I needed to find someone before I graduate that needed this. If it was highlighted green and they have the initial, that means I completed it with this patient. Leaving the initial is helpful because, well, one, I mean, it's HIPAA compliant. It doesn't say their name, but leaving the initial is helpful because say that um, a lot of times how they track requirements is by certain codes. And sometimes things just get swiped wrong. And towards the end of graduation, trust me, it is such a mess and headache trying to make sure you got all the credits for everything you did. Sometimes you'll be like, wait, I know I did this procedure on someone. Why didn't I get the credit for it? If you leave their initials, then you can go back to their chart and verify that you did do it, and then you can get a swipe for it. But say I didn't leave the initials, I just highlighted the screen. I would be like, this actually did happen to me on one of my silly little requirements. I finally figured it out, but it was so frustrating because I was like, who did I do this on? You do so many things by the time you graduate that like you don't remember necessarily. So just do yourself a favor, do your fourth year, last month of school, self a favor and leave their initials. And then I would color code things blue, color code things blue if I had a treatment plan for a person but not completed yet. Now you may be wondering, Connie, why is there a distinction because between those that are only treatment plan and those that are done? Because in dental school, I like to say nothing is done until it's in the patient's mouth and they've walked out the door. And even then, sometimes it's not guaranteed things happen, okay? Sometimes you'll treatment plan and be like, great, I found a patient with like, that needs 10 crowns. It's like all of my requirements, like I'm graduating early or whatever, I'm like, I'm graduating on time. And then something might happen. Maybe they can't afford the care or maybe they have an emergency and they can't show up to the appointments on time or, you know, things happen and you have to leave room and grace for that. So by distinction, like having that distinction of what is planned versus what is done done, you can know like, okay, do I need a backup on this? If I need a backup on this, then like, who am I looking for? This is what I mean when this is how you go above and beyond to make sure that you're being efficient. Do you need to do this if you're not a spreadsheet person? No, I don't think so. But also if you're following dental shadowers, you're probably really proactive and a, a great student. So claps to you. So I highly recommend doing something like this. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. Um, but just having something to keep yourself accountable and on track is really, really helpful because at the end of the day, a lot of times I went home feeling overwhelmed being like, how am I going to graduate on time? And then you just look at this list and slowly over time, everything becomes green and you can feel good. Like eventually I was able to look at it and be like, okay, I'm like 70% done just from seeing how much green I had left and blue. So that's my little hack for you guys. Okay. Tip number four, this is, I believe my last set of tips, but Clinic is really, in a lot of senses, it is a mind game in that you have to keep your head in the game. Rule number one of keeping your head in the game is don't compare yourself to others. You guys have heard this before. You guys will hear it again. There's something about dental school that just makes you compare yourself to other people. I don't know why. I haven't cracked the code on why, and I'm glad that it's behind me because it's really hard. Um, and so if you don't stop comparing yourself to others now, you will just keep doing it in the real world. You have to break that habit. I see it now, now that I'm in the real world, it is so easy to compare yourself and be like, oh my God, this person's producing this much money and like blah, blah, blah. And you will never be happy with yourself if all you have is by comparing yourself to others. There's gonna be a lot of times where you compare yourself to others in terms of grades, in terms of projects. You're like, that person's crown looks beautiful. That person's denture looks beautiful. And then you're gonna feel really bad about yourself. And it's, it's normal, it, it'll happen sometimes. But what I'm saying is try your best to avoid it because it spills over into clinic. Uh, you'll be like, oh my God, my friends already finished all their denture cases and I'm still working on this. Like they finished all their crowns early. And it's just such a toxic way of thinking, especially because someone else doing something does not take away from you doing it either. In many ways, you can look at other people doing amazing things as inspiration, as, as proof that it can happen, right? That's how you really succeed is by having that mentality and seeing other people, not as competition, but as proof. So don't compare yourself to others. Also help each other and be open with your attendings from the start about what you guys are behind on. Having that list really helps. What I mean by helping each other is sometimes dental school can feel like a very like dog eat dog kind of world. Every school is like that, every single school. And that's because, you know, it's just the fact of what dentistry is. Resources are limited, time, are, time is limited. And it's just the real world is dog eat dog. 
So the how we survive this, how we really hack this is by helping each other with requirements, share things with your friends, um, share advice with your friends. You can even share patience with your friends sometimes. Just share and really help one another and it will pay you back and it'll make everything so much more enjoyable. Like even though dental school was really painful, I still think it was such an incredible time because I have so many good memories from you know, being with my friends. Um, and I'm really glad that I spent that time to make good friends in dental school. I think someone's microphone is on if you guys can turn that off. Thank you. Um, okay, and then the third tip is just fight the urge and survival instinct to feel overwhelmed. It is such a survival instinct to feel overwhelmed um, because you're just in a new environment. Like I said, it's so much change. But the thing that you don't realize until the end is that you will actually exponentially grow more than you expect. So for example, my first month of dental school, I was really discouraged because I was like, oh my God, maybe even my first three months, I was like, oh my God, like I'm so behind on requirements. I'm so slow, blah, blah, blah. I, for some backstory, I inherited the smallest rock in my clinic and that really got to me because I was like oh my god I have less patients than everyone that means I'm gonna like be here forever and like I might not graduate on time um and the thing is that really didn't matter you know why because I built my roster with high quality good patient interactions like I told you about and all the things I just told you about but the thing that I didn't account for was how yeah month three in the game I was still taking the full time even running over for many procedures month four I was like hitting the benchmark then something happens after a couple months. It might not be month five. And, and, you know, I don't really remember exactly when it happened, but somewhere along the lines, you exponentially get better. All of a sudden, it takes you way less time. You can get many requirements done in one appointment. All of a sudden, you understand everything a little bit easier. It's kind of like how first and second year, when you first start dental school, you're kind of like tripped up by the terminology. You're like, what? Like mesio, distal, molar, like there's all these foreign words. By the time you're a second year or a third year, these words click and you understand this new language, right? Kind of the same with clinic. In the beginning, you're gonna be like, okay, this feeling, how do I do it? Doesn't make sense. You're gonna think about everything as like, um, as like step A, B, C, D. By the time, after a certain amount of time, you're gonna hit your exponential stride where all of a sudden everything starts working together. You can do multiple steps at the same time. And that's when the dentisting really starts is when you're not thinking all of a sudden textbooks step by step. And then you start to understand how to do things maybe faster, more efficiently, smoothly. And so I didn't account for that. And I want you guys to account for that. You will exponentially grow. Last but not least, control what you can control and truly forget the rest because you need to sleep at night. The world needs you to sleep at night. Your patients need you to sleep at night. And you just cannot spend time worrying about things that you cannot control. It's really not worth it. So anyways, that is all I have for you guys today. Um, I actually, if you guys want, I pulled a lot of these main tips from my podcast episode, but if you guys want to listen to the whole episode, I think I was a lot more entertaining in my podcast episode, to be honest. So today, today I'm a little tired and frazzled, but I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. But if you want, uh, I guess, more entertaining and thorough explanation of everything, you can check out this podcast episode, The Secrets to Surviving Clinic, Getting Requirements, Maximizing Experience, and Avoiding Trauma and Anxiety. So this is my podcast, just a quick pinch, shameless self-promotion. Um, I talk about self-help, career, and lifestyle for young women in healthcare. Although, like I said, I do have male pinchers. Uh, pinchers is what we call my community. And we give you guys advice from dating coaches, nutritionalists, financial advisors. Basically, my mission for this podcast is to teach you guys everything that school didn't teach us. And so it's teaching people that take care of others for a living how to actually take care of ourselves. So yeah, anyways, I will stop sharing my screen. And I guess now is time for a question and answer segment. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and essential tips. We really appreciate you. And I'm gonna wait for some questions to appear in the chat. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them. Okay. And I'll get us started. So I wanted to ask you, um, what was your dental philosophy? What is your dental philosophy? I love this question so much because I feel like it's really smart in that it acknowledges that there are many philosophies in dentistry and none of them are wrong. Um, that's one thing that you'll never catch anyone doing really is, or you shouldn't catch anyone doing really, is bashing each other or bashing our profession, you know, our peers and whatnot, because there are so many ways to look at how to treat something, so many ways to look at something. So my personal philosophy if with dentistry is that high quality, good dentistry is not about the dentistry. What I've learned in real life dentistry is that it doesn't matter really what the filling looks like. The patient doesn't know what a good filling is, but what matters is, does the patient feel like you heard what they're saying? Does the patient feel like they're being comforted and being taken care of, not being taken advantage. 
does the patient feel like you're the right one to help them? And so dentistry, true, the beauty of true dentistry and what I love to do every single day is just build connections. It's all, you know, when I'm checking their hygiene exam, like hearing about their kids' lives, hearing about what's important to them and how I can be a part of their lives. And to me, that's the beauty of dentistry at least with general dentistry for me, I get to see the life cycle of so many wonderful life events. And um, a little example I always say is I had a patient one time where like they couldn't eat steak and steak was their celebration food. And so when I finally gave them, you know, I think it, it wasn't me. Let me be honest. I was assisting, I think. And it was like an implant or something like that. I truly don't even remember what the restoration is, which is proof of how dentistry is not about the dentistry. I gave them some mm -hmm. kind of, we gave them some kind of restoration where all of a sudden they could eat steak again. And what I felt in that moment was not, oh, I gave someone an implant. It was that I gave them the ability to celebrate with their kids when their kids graduate from high school with a steak dinner. I gave them the ability to celebrate Christmas with their family when they have steak for dinner. I gave them back, we gave them back the gift of living their life again. And that's what I want you guys to feel about dentistry is it's never, it shouldn't be about the production, how much money you make, how glamorous, blah, 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 because it's really not a, glamorous at all but it should be about how much life we can give back to our patients and like how we can serve them yeah that's really beautiful thank you um, okay yeah. so we do have some questions in the chat emma asks did you find it easier or harder to get into dental school compared to graduating from dental school so i guess she's asking like the process of it yeah Oh my God, I was literally talking about this yesterday with one of my best friends from dental school. We all agree the hardest part was being a pre-dent, y'all. So you guys are just in the hard part. I promise you guys, once you get into yeah. school, it gets easier in the sense that pre-dental is the hardest it'll be because you're always wondering, like, is this hard worth work it? worth it can i get into school will i get to be a dentist i remember sitting at my desk studying for the dat and like i was not doing well in the dat and i was like um, on my practice test and i was like is this the thing that's going to stop me from being dentist being a dentist is this where it all ends and then the thing is once you get into school yeah you're going to have hard moments it's kind of like the worst four years of your life but in the sense that it, it also is fine you make friends it's great but you know when you're in dental school that you're going to be a dentist these schools they want you to stay truthfully. They want to make you dentists. Also, they want your money. So they will keep you in the school. So don't worry about that. Just get into the dental school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Okay, our next question from Vita is, um, what motivates you to go to the office each day? And what do you look forward to? Yeah, so truly, I mean, you know, like with my little steak story, what motivates me to go to the office is just getting to meet incredible patients, be a part of their lives. And I just love being someone that can fix the problem in front of me. Um, I came from a career in pharmacy where it, it's a beautiful profession. You could do a lot with it, but I just felt frustrated because in pharmacy, I was always the middleman. I was always waiting for someone else to do something. And with dentistry, for example, like a normal day of like slight work is like my patient came in for an emergency yesterday. They chipped their front tooth. They walked out with a new tooth. They couldn't even tell which tooth had broke. Like it was just so awesome that I could in less than an hour, help someone walk out and feel like themselves again. So I just really love that is helping my patients feel like their best selves. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so we have another question from Dalbert. Did you ever feel like you would be in an educational setting for such a long time? And if so, what helped you get through that? This is so interesting. So one of my like good friends from dental school, his name is Delpert. So at first I was like, oh my God, is he here? And then I, he spells it with a P though. So I, I don't think it's him, but um, thank you for the question. Did I ever feel like I would be in an education setting for so long? The thing is, I didn't really think about the education setting. I just had the goal in mind to become the dentist. And having that goal in mind, that end goal in mind is so important. You would be amazed what happens when you just set your mind to a certain goal and endpoint. You will get there, but you have to care about that endpoint enough. So, for example, when I was in pharmacy school, even before pharmacy school, I was a horrible student, you guys. Like, I always got, like, okay, maybe this isn't horrible, but like, compared to like my pre whatever friends, I felt horrible. I always, I got like C's in orgo in high school, I got C's in like physics and biology and all that stuff. I felt like, I felt like I wasn't worthy of a career that I loved. And I felt really bad about myself. And so I kind of just played into it. I was like, whatever, it's fine. I'll just never become anything, it's fine. What changed things for me was when I started to believe in myself and when I suddenly had a vision for what I wanted to do with my life, 
which was once I started assisting in a dental office, I saw like I could be this person to fix their teeth and fix their lives basically, like help them feel like themselves again. And once I had that shred of self-belief that I could do it, all of a sudden my grades in pharmacy school like exponentially shot up. So I did all my pre-dents while requirements while I was in pharmacy school, which is really, really hard. But um, but this is, you know, anyone can do it. That's that's what I'm saying is anyone, as long as you're motivated and you find your why. For me, it was that steak dinner story. For you guys, you will all have your own story. So just hold on to that story because that story is gonna get you a lot farther than if you, you know, like think about really how long you're in it because the time will pass anyways. So you might as well do it pursuing your dreams. Okay, that's lovely. Okay, another question from Emma is, was the transition to real life after graduating dental school difficult? Oh, this is also one of my questions. So that's perfect. It's so difficult. You guys, you guys are <laughs> watching the transition right now. It's horrible. No, it's not horrible. In many ways, it's awesome because I finally get to do what I love and I get to be like the doc and like, y'all, I haven't had to in this real world dentistry. I don't have to clean the room. I don't have to like take the x-rays. Like, I feel like I'm living good. Like, I just get to do the fillings and make them look pretty. And then, you know, like it's, it's after backbreaking work, working as a dental assistant, and you know all the school stuff I feel like finally I'm living that good dentist life and the thing is y'all that good dentist life is hard okay <laughs> you're really tired and you have a lot of decisions to make there's like um there's some viral TikTok song right now that's like I girl boss a little too close to the sun or something and now here I am with emails from people that's like me right yeah. now I'm like <laughs> I girl boss a little too hard and now I have responsibilities it's difficult but what I will tell you is just because something's difficult, just because something's painful or hard, doesn't mean it's bad. The best things in life have been difficult. So yeah, when I come home, am I tired? Yes. But do I feel awesome and like there's nothing else I would rather do? Yeah, also that. So don't worry about things being difficult. Just worry about instead not feeling fulfilled. That I think that was the worst mm -hmm. part for me. Yes. Okay, another question we have is from Jose. What's a major misconception about dental school? Also, do you have any advice for current applicants in this cycle? So I think a major misconception is it's easy to feel like everyone knows something that you don't or everyone has something that you don't. It's easy to have that imposter syndrome and think like, oh, everybody else has like A's in this and I only have like an A minus in this or everybody else like worked for their parents that are dentists and like my parents weren't dentists. My parents weren't dentists either. So I had that kind of like imposter syndrome being like, can I really do this? And so my best advice for anyone in this cycle is really focus on what makes you special because that is something that none of those other applicants have and everyone has something that makes them special. Um, I actually cried at work yesterday for good for a good reason because I was talking to one of the, like the clinical director um, and it's really easy. I, I just had like my first couple of weeks of work and I felt so much imposter syndrome, you guys, even though I'm presenting to you guys about how to be a dentist, I was like, oh, I feel like I'm not fast enough. I feel like I don't know half the time what I'm doing. And she said, you know, Connie, you were exactly what we needed. This team needed someone that could make work fun, that could make people laugh. And that just really hit me because I was like, you know what? There is a place for everyone to contribute to a team. And so don't ever feel like you're not enough for something. It's just that you haven't found the right team yet. So I felt very lucky because I feel like I'm in the right place with a team that sees me for my strengths. And so you will also find a school, a team, a group of friends that sees you for you. So hold on to that and don't be so hard on yourself because you're doing a lot better than you think you are. Okay. So I think that's the last question in the chat. I do have one last question myself is, um, do you plan on opening your own practice one day? So it's tough. It's funny. I feel like that's what everyone says you have to do to like build financial freedom and yada, yada, yada. And I think for a lot of people, it is the right decision. For me personally, I just don't see myself doing that um, because what I love about dentistry is like the clinical part of it, like getting to talk to people currently, at least. I love getting to talk to my patients. Um, and I love getting to talk to you guys, mentoring people, having my podcast. Those are, have always been my passions in life. So if anything, I don't think I would open my own practice. I think I would just go full force into the podcast. My dream is to someday, you know, work clinically, maybe like two to three times a week, and then also spend the rest of the week being able to podcast for you guys. So yeah, I don't think owning a practice is fully in the cards for me. I'm not huge into that business side of things. Uh, but you never know what will change. One of my mentors, like on Instagram, you probably know her, Joyce the Dentist. She always said, she's like, I dreamed of like being like, um, like a yoga Pilates mom or whatever. And then she ended up realizing that she wanted to own and be her own boss. So I'm, I'm similar to her in a lot of ways. And I'm curious if I will ever change like that. 
but currently Connie doesn't really want to own a practice yet. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Connie, today for sharing your passions, your experience, and your advice for clinic. And uh, with that, I'll conclude this meeting. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, yeah, the podcast is just a quick pinch. Um, you can find it. Let me write it. Just a quick pinch. So I actually, funny enough, I named it that because I realized every day in clinic, <laughs> I was saying that whenever I'd anesthetize a patient, I'm like, all right, just a quick pinch. I say it all the time. And so it just became a phrase that I use, and that's the name of the podcast. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> thank all you. Right, everyone, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.